Okay. Are there any questions before I start? All right. So what we're going to cover is uh, the extension of choice theory to choices or options which whose outcomes are uncertain. So if you're going to the supermarket, you're buying bread and vegetables and milk, um, you pretty much know what you're getting. Yes. Um, whereas uh, when you are, you know, you have some savings and you want to invest your money, uh, you're looking at various options. There are stocks and bonds and fixed deposits and mutual funds. Um, so there are many of your choices are uncertain choices. So if you buy some shares of um, Google or Reliance or what have you, you don't know at the end of the year what returns there will be, you know, how much dividends they'll pay out or what will be the capital gains? What will be the price of the stock one year from now? You don't know that. You can look at past historical data and you can formulate some guesses. Uh, Point estimates would, of course, be foolhardy. Uh, you know, on average, you can sort of look at the last 10, 15 years, there's been an average return, but then there's substantial variance around that average returns. And, and once in a while, there's a major crisis which hits and the stock market nosedives. So the support of the distribution of what, what the value of your portfolio is going to be uh, is, is pretty broad, okay? And of course, uh, intuitively speaking, there are uh, there are um, different um, factors you may want to take into account. Now, let's begin by trying to understand what matters when uh, you're you're choosing among options whose whose uh, payoff to you, whose utility uh, is quite uncertain to you. Um, what what do you consider as relevant? Okay, so suppose uh, you know just to cook up a very simple example. Suppose I offer you a bet, uh, which is that um, I'll toss a coin. If you so it's like a lottery. I'm offering you. Uh, I'll toss a coin. If it's heads, I'll pay you hundred rupees. If it's tails, I'll pay you nothing. So you have a 50% chance of winning 100 rupees. That's the lottery you face. And I'm selling you a ticket for this lottery. Okay. So the question is, uh, what's the maximum we're willing to pay to buy this lottery ticket? A lottery which promises you 100 rupees with 50% chance and nothing with the remaining 50%. So what's your maximum willingness to pay for this lottery ticket? So the expected value of gain from the lottery. So one approach you can take is calculate the mathematical expectation of the monetary earnings from the lottery. So uh, the ex mathematical expectation will be half times 100 rupees plus half times zero, which is 50 rupees. So for starters, you may want to say that I'll I'll evaluate these kinds of uncertain prospects uh, or options by their expected monetary value. In this particular instance, it'll be 50 rupees. Now that misses something important. Uh, so to illustrate that, let me give you a second example. Suppose I offer you another lottery, which is a little more complicated. Uh, so it goes like this. Um, I'll toss a coin. If it comes up heads, I'll pay you two rupees. If it comes out tails, I'll toss the coin again. If it if it's heads the second time around, I'll pay you four rupees, two to the power two. The general formula is I'll keep tossing a coin till it first comes up heads. That's where I stop. And if it comes up heads for the first time after n tosses, then I will pay you two to the power n, right? Uh, is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. So uh, how much will you pay for this? What's the maximum you want to pay? 
anybody wants to pay 100 rupees for this for this lottery ticket so this lottery gives you a whole distribution of possible prizes with probability half you can win two rupees with probability one fourth uh, you can win four rupees with probability uh, one eight you can win eight rupees and so on So certain n outcomes will earn n. Will earn well if 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 the first head is after n tosses, then you win two to the power n. Okay. Okay. Sir, I wouldn't pay hundred rupees because technically you know that. Um, the, because it's a, if it's a fair coin, the probability of getting ahead in the first few tosses is technically quite high. And so it's possible that I get ahead in, if not the first toss, at least the second or the third toss, in which I'd end up getting probably four or eight rupees, but I have to actually pay 100. Yes. So with, there's a good chance you will win much less than 100. Okay. But there is a chance that you will win much more than 100. Okay. There's a string of tails. Uh, and head comes after many tosses, there's a positive probability of that. For example, there's a positive probability, strictly positive, however small, that uh, the first 99 throws will all be tails and uh, heads will appear on the hundredth, right? There is some chance of that. So, so yeah, you could win less than 100 rupees, you could win more than 100 rupees. Uh, so the question is, how do we, how do we evaluate all of that. What is the summary judgment uh, as far as this lottery is concerned? Now, you can try to answer that at two levels. You could try to answer it intuitively. And that's what I was asking. That what does it feel like? What does your instinct say? Uh, how, how far you're willing to go to buy this lottery? Uh, 100 rupees, probably to most of you, would seem excessive. 10 rupees, that's something you can ask yourself. Maybe that intuitive answer isn't that obvious. But let's change tracks. Let's apply this criterion that we just talked about, which is uh, we'll, we'll try to evaluate lotteries by their expected monetary value. So what is the expected monetary value of this thing which I just described? What is the value? Anyone? So it's N. N infinity it's infinity so let's look at it um, okay so there's a whole probability distribution of course okay let's start from the first possibility uh, with probability half, it's heads the very first time. In that case, your winning is two. Okay, once the head appears, the prize is paid out, it ends there. So, uh, now, it's possible that the first toss is a tail and the second one is a head. What is that probability? One fourth. And in that case, how much do you win? You win four rupees. There's also a possibility first two tosses are tails and the third one is a head. What's that probability? One eighth. Uh, what's your prize? Eight. And so on. One sixteenth by sixteen. Notice that each of these terms is exactly one, right? Because that's the way it's constructed. It cancels out. Um, so this is one plus one plus so this is not a convergent series it adds up to infinity so if you believed that we evaluate lotteries by their expected monetary value then you have to conclude that uh, this lottery is worth paying whatever amount of money you have right take out your last dime and put it on this lottery that would be the suggestion but that would be crazy I think no normal, sensible person would be willing to pay, forget infinity, uh, won't be willing to pay too high 
certainly probably not more than 100 rupees, probably much less. So what is the catch? What is wrong with this criterion which we just applied? That's so the... here we do not get a finite expectation. So we are not unable to find out how much are we willing to pay based on the monetary values. The variance also tends to infinity. So the risk is very, very high. Okay. So the variance is actually not infinity, but the variance is high. Yes. Uh, so one way to sort of capture the lesson of this is to say that we not we don't only care about the mean of the distribution, we also care about the variance. There may be a prospect which is going to make me very rich in expectation. In expectation, it will be maybe one crore rupees, but it could be more than that with some probability. It could be substantially less. It could even be zero with, with some probability. And I'm worried about those low outcomes. And so, uh, so, so once again, to summarize, uh, maybe not just the mean or the expectation of the distribution, but its variance also uh, matters in some way, right? We, we care about the variance. And a high mean is a good thing, but a high variance is a bad thing, okay? Um, so this example is called the St. Petersburg paradox because in St. Petersburg around this, uh, uh, you know, this was, I think 19th century, I forget the exact uh, time period. Uh, there was, um, uh, there was a lot of interest among various kinds of people, mathematicians, statisticians, uh, uh, business people. Uh, there was a lot of attempt to understand risk and uh, randomness and so on. Um, and um, so, uh, so this example came up as, as a refutation of the idea that uh, the expectation of a lottery is a sufficient statistic for its worth. It's, it's, it's not, okay? Mm. Now, one explanation of this so-called St. Petersburg paradox was provided by Daniel Bernoulli, the famous uh, mathematician, who, who said that uh, people don't evaluate lotteries by their expected monetary value, but by their expected utility. Okay, and utility of money is concave, there's diminishing returns. So the first million dollars is worth a lot, but once you are very, very rich, once you have more than 100 million, an extra million is not worth that much more to you. So, so there's a concave utility function of money. And so when we are just evaluating this lottery by the monetary values, we are getting all these ones. But if we take the utility value of these prices, two, four, eight, 16, and so on, then they'll taper off, okay? And therefore, this will be a convergent series and it will have a finite sum. Broadly speaking, that was the explanation provided. Now, from a modern perspective, problem with that example is, once again, we have to we have to take the notion of utility seriously, and it's a psychological uh, measure which we cannot really, you know, which 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 uh, is is not really objectively measurable. So we don't want to build a theory assuming something like uh, utility exists in people's heads. Um, so, but we have seen it in in you know, topic two, choice under certainty. We have seen that we can recover the notion of utility in an as if sense, right? We can, we can build a theory of choice on the ordinal approach where we assume that uh, the agent is able to rank various alternatives. And then if that ranking satisfies certain properties, then we can uh, construct a utility function and uh, analyze the problem as if the consumer or the agent is maximizing some utility function. So we'll take the same approach over here. Uh, the, this approach to understanding risky or uncertain choices uh, goes back to the book by 
von Neumann und Morgenstern called Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. Uh, there, they laid out a theoretical foundation of, of choice under uncertainty using the ax axiomatic approach, which leads to what is called expected utility theory. So that's what we'll develop today. Um, it's an extension of choice under certainty, similar ordinal approach. Um, and the expected utility theory was further extended by uh, Leonard Savage uh, and others. Um, but I'll, I'll talk more about that later. So let's look at the von Neumann Morgenstern uh, approach to expected utility. Any questions? No? Okay, so let's. Sir? Yes. Sir, in the St. Peter, Petersburg problem, can we apply that uh, in the large sample? We can take uh, from the sample size, we can extract it. And from that, uh, we can apply the expectation. In statistics, we do it. You don't have the luxury of a large sample over there because uh, the, the, the way the problem is posed, uh, the, you face the lottery only once. It's not like, um, it's not like um, I'm, I'm offering you the lottery over and over again, okay? okay. If, 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 if the same lottery is available over and over again, then you can fall back on something like the law of large numbers and say that, okay, you know, sometimes I'll get less than expectation, sometimes I'll get more than expectation, but over a large number of trials, independent trials, uh, I'll, I'll make pretty close to what the expected value value of the lottery is. And so I don't need to care about anything else, especially variance. Uh, that, that logic would apply when you're facing that lottery repeatedly, many, many times. Uh, but in most of the problems that we're interested in, uh, including the St. Petersburg paradox, but also things like you know, buying of insurance uh, and so on, uh, there you face the risk only once. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so that's why variance matters. Uh, even if the St. Petersburg uh, problem lottery was offered to you, just as a side note, uh, even if it were uh, offered to you repeatedly, yeah, even then <laughs> there's an issue because suppose you bet all you have on the, the first time it's offered to you. Uh, you could very well go, go broke, right? So the next time, even though there's an offer, you have nothing to put up. Uh, so that leads to problems like gamblers, ruin problems, and so on and so forth. But let me not get too much into that. Um, health insurance, right? Um, I mean, should you buy health insurance or not? Well, if there's a serious disease or accident, I mean, it's over. If you haven't bought insurance, right, you're, you're financially ruined. So the next time you uh, you you uh, uh, your starting point will become uh, a terrible starting point. Okay, let's develop the formal analysis. Um, so there's a set of outcomes. We'll take it to be a finite set, right? But in many applications, we'll take this set of outcomes to be a continuum. Now, these outcomes can be anything. In many applications, like you know, buying of insurance or investing, et cetera, these will be monetary values. Well, for example, if I'm buying a, 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 a share, some shares of a company, uh, these A's could be the value of my portfolio after one year, OK? Uh, but for other purposes, these A's could be other things. So for example, if you're choosing a career, you know, after your master's, should you take up a corporate job offer which you have or should you go out to do PhD? Uh, so then these outcomes could involve not just your salary, but also your job satisfaction, your stress level, work hours, what have you, all kinds of things. So, um, okay, so finite set of outcomes. Now, uh, every choice that the agent faces 
can be thought of as a probability distribution over these outcomes. Yes. Some choices may be, so, so that's how we'll write it. Uh, so this just means that the outcome A1 arises with probability P1, outcome A2 with probability P2, and lastly, outcome N with probability Pn. All these Ps have to be between zero and one, and they have to add up to one, okay? It has to be a genuine probability distribution. So every possible choice or option can be thought of as such a probability distribution, and there are different probability distributions. So if you're, uh, if you're uh, looking between the share of one company and a fixed deposit in a bank, uh, then each is a different probability distribution. Um, and we'll denote a lottery by G. This is a short sort of form. Um, now, uh, a special case of a gamble or a lottery, as I have defined it, a special case is the degenerate distribution. So, so think of the lottery, which puts probability one on the outcome AI and probability zero on all the other outcomes. So that lottery is basically the outcome AI, the sure prospect. Uh, so, so if you put your money in your in a fixed deposit, uh, then you know you know it's it's a fixed interest uh, option. Uh, so you know ahead of time what the value of your portfolio will be if you exercise that choice. So that's a degenerate distribution. Um, now we can make a distinction between simple lotteries and compound lotteries. Okay, what's a simple lottery? A simple lottery is a probability distribution over the outcomes themselves. What's a compound lottery? The compound lottery is a probability distribution over lotteries, okay? Um, so um, with probability Q1, you will, uh, you will get the lottery G1 with probability Q2, G2, and so on and so forth. Uh, so just to make it absolutely clear, uh, uh, the St. Petersburg problem example is, a, is an example of a, of a compound uh, lottery, right? With probability half, uh, you get, uh, you know, it's heads first time and you get two. Uh, with probability half, it's tails first time. In that case, you what you face is not a prize, but more lotteries down the line. Right? So, uh, here you end up getting four, uh, but if it stales again, then it gets postponed even further, and so it goes. So after some of the branches, uh, what lies ahead is another lottery, not uh, a known monetary value. So that's an example of a compound lottery. It's, it's a lottery over lotteries. Uh, so just a for the notation, um, um, so SG is the set of all simple lotteries, which are direct probability distributions over the outcomes. And S is the set of all lotteries uh, um, uh, simple as well as compound. Yeah. And the preference relationship here will apply to these lotteries that we have just defined. Okay. Uh, so you may have two lotteries, each is a probability distribution like this. And the agent has to choose between them. So the agent will assume to be uh, having some preference over. Uh, lotteries of this form. And as usual, we'll impose some assumptions or axioms on these preferences and see whether we can get to something useful from that. Questions? Everybody clear on the notations and meanings and everything? Sir, uh, I had a question regarding uh, the St. Petersburg paradox. Mm -hmm. So, there's a Petrograd game where there's a plus one amount of um, 
uh, wealth added to each of the outcomes while the probability remains the same okay so in that case uh, is the petrograd game dominating the st petersburg game so just to be clear uh, if it's heads first time you win 2, two plus one. 1 next time it's 4 plus 1 then it's 8 plus 1 16 plus 1 yeah I, so I'm... does it I don't see how that changes anything, right? You're just adding an extra amount. So if, without that uh, extra rupee, if if the sum was infinity, expected value, then with this extra thing thrown in, it's it's still infinity. Yes, sir, yes, sir. it is infinity. No, I'm asking that, is there, I mean, in a choice between St. Petersburg and this game where we're adding one extra unit of wealth for each outcome, would... What is the point? What is the point? I mean, he, he, the original point, I mean, the way uh -huh. I use the example is to show that uh, the, or the mean or the expected value is not all that matters, right? There's uh, something more than that, which is valuable. Now, adding this extra thing is not changing that point or altering it in any way or, or adding anything to that, right? Okay, okay, okay. Because I was thinking of if we could uh, show the uh, certainty outcome of uh, not playing the game as a sequence of zero outcomes where we subtract the wealth from each outcome to show that uh, the St. Petersburg game dominates the case of uh, zero returns or not playing the game. I, I'm not aware of this example. It must have been cooked up to make some point, which I, I don't know. But for the purpose of the discussion that we are having, uh, adding this one extra rupee to every outcome does not change anything at all. Right. Okay. okay. It, it, the point still remains that uh, that it's in, infinite, so it doesn't that, change. that we don't uh, evaluate uh, uh, uncertain outcomes and lotteries just by their expected value. There's yeah. something beyond this. Higher moments are also things that we care about. Yes. Okay. Um. Okay. So let's get to the axioms. Um. So there's going to be six axioms. Most of them will sound pretty reasonable. There's one axiom, which I'll come to, which is extremely tricky and has been the sort of focus of a lot of research. Uh, the other ones are, are perhaps relatively uncontroversial, but let's go through them. Axiom one, completeness. It's just, uh, just an extension of the same axiom on the, uh, certainty right completeness says that give any two rock lotteries to the agent the agent will be able to rank them okay. indifference is allowed uh that's not a problem but the agent shouldn't throw up her hands and say uh, i i don't know which one i prefer that is that is ruled out okay fine axiom two transitivity again an old familiar friend uh, there's no hope of creating a theory of choice uh, without the transitivity axiom practically. So we'll, we'll assume that and, and at the individual level seems like a reasonable assumption. This is ruling out loops, preferential loops. Um, okay, done with transitivity. Axiom three, continuity. Uh, so what is this saying? Uh, without loss of generality, let's do one thing. Uh, let's, uh, let's say that the sure outcomes, A1, A2, AN, they're arranged in descending order of preference, meaning A1 is the best possible outcome of all the N outcomes, and AN is the worst, okay? The continuity axiom is saying that take any lottery, I can always find an equivalent lottery, equivalent meaning that the agent considers is, is, is indifferent. I can find an equivalent lottery, which is just a probability distribution over the best thing and the worst thing, which puts no probability on anything intermediate, okay? Um, okay. Um, now, um, so that's the continuity axiom. That's, that's uh, you know, the, we can always find something equivalent 
in this in this smaller class of lotteries, which which involve only the best and the worst outcomes. Um, in some situations, you may be a little bit skeptical of this. For example, if a n is uh, let's say a death, you know, the agent kind of dies. It's the worst possible thing. You might say that well. Um, I, if I have a lottery which doesn't put any weight on death, uh, there is nothing, there's no lottery, equivalent lottery, if, if it involves some risk of death, however small, right? Or in other words, our preferences are lexicographic in the probability of death. You might say uh, that, that oh, you know, if we are facing a number of prospects, the first thing I look at is in which am I safe safest physically and then i look at everything else so if we have lexicographic preferences in terms of you know life and death uh, then this continuity axiom will be violated okay now the question is in reality do we have such lexicographic preferences you may be tempted to say yes but then if you look at many of our choices so for example if i were really literally uh infinitely risk averse with respect to uh, uh, fatal accidents, um, then I'll, I'll, I'll basically sit at home, I'll never leave home after all, while crossing the street, I could be run over. Um, but we don't do that, right? For reasons of practicality, for, you know, uh, for earning a livelihood, for um, enjoying ourselves, going on trips, what have you. Uh, we're always incurring teeny tiny small probabilities of, of uh, fatality, right? Uh, life would be impossible to live if we were just literally lexicographic in, in, in terms of uh, risk of life or, or death. Uh, in fact, there are, you know, sometimes you'll come across notions like what is the, the value of a statistical life, okay? Uh, economists estimate what is the value of a statistical life? Uh, broadly speaking, what they do is the following. They look at uh, different professions, uh, uh, different professions which require the same kind of qualifications. Of course, you can't compare bricklayers with lawyers because the qualification requirements are different, but for a given qualification level, let's say, let's say high school diploma, uh, you know, CBSC certificate or something, um, you look at various professions and you have data on the risk factor of different professions, right? Desk bound jobs have lower risk of accidental death. Uh, jobs like construction jobs have a higher, uh, higher risk of death, which you can actually estimate from the data by looking at, you know, how many people died on the job in, the, in that profession uh, in the course of a year, what fraction of workers. Uh, so, so you have risk estimates from the data. And you also have average wages uh, from the data, okay? And typically you'll find positive correlation. So, so riskier hazardous jobs, measurably riskier and hazardous jobs have pay measurably higher wages. So that wage differential is sometimes called the compensating differential. So it is just enough so that the average worker would be indifferent between the two professions because in equilibrium, both professions have to have to hire and function. So uh, construction jobs have a little bit of a risk premium. Uh, extremely hazardous jobs like Alaskan crab fishermen, right? Compared to their uh, compatriots in other professions using similar qualifications, they get paid more. And that's to cover for the extra risk. They could be swept out to sea and so on. So uh, the value of a statistical life exploits this positive correlation. And it says that, well, uh, if for a 1% increase in accidental death, uh, uh, a profession is paying uh, 10,000 rupees extra salary, right? Uh, let's say that's one lakh rupees over the lifetime in present discounted value. So then that means that for uh, to, to reduce your risk of death, you're willing to give up uh, one lakh rupees over the lifetime which means that the value of your statistical life is that one lakh, which is for a 1% probability, times 100, right? Anyway, so the, this entire methodology of trying to put a value on life relies on the fact that in 
actual choices people are willing to accept slightly higher probability of death if they're compensated enough if their if their salary and earnings is is high enough uh, to compensate for that okay so those kinds of observations may lead us to accept the continuity axiom questions sir uh, yes. does the continuity axiom uh, help us uh, to say that the expected utility theory that we are uh, studying that says that the utility of a person is bounded of an individual is bounded can we reach that from this continuity axiom we'll look at the consequences right now we are laying down the axioms and asking the question are they reasonable axioms are they empirically relevant uh, based on introspection and observations do we find the axioms appealing do they come from Earth or do they come from Mars? That's our focus at this point. Now, what are the consequences of these axioms? That's something I'm, I'm, which is coming further down the line. Yeah? So we'll, we'll yes, see. Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So axiom four is monotonicity. Uh, eminently reasonable, easy to understand. This is saying compare two lotteries, which are both probability distributions over the best and the worst outcomes. That lottery, which puts higher probability on the best outcome is the preferred lottery. Right? Um, so with these two prob distributions, if, if and only if alpha is greater than beta, the first lottery will be preferred to the second one. Sensible, um, not much to discuss. Okay, um, let me skip axiom five. Let me jump to axiom six and then I'll come back to axiom five uh, because axiom five is the tricky one that I mentioned. Okay, what is axiom six saying? Axiom six is saying that uh, for any lottery, essentially the spirit of axiom six is that the process doesn't matter or how many layers of uncertainty there is, doesn't matter to the agent. Uh, what the agent really cares about is the final distribution over, uh, over the outcomes. Okay, let's uh, let me explain what that means. Uh, let me take a truncated version of the St. Petersburg uh, lottery, okay? Meaning that uh, the coin tosses will not go on forever. I'll, I'll do it uh, up to two rounds. So first time heads, you win two rupees. Uh, tail followed by heads, you win four rupees. Two tails consecutive, after that you win nothing. Okay? So let's consider that lottery. Um, so what is the lottery then? Uh, if I depict it in, a, in terms of a tree, with probability half, you're going to get two. With probability uh, half, uh, it stales the first time. And then there will be a second coin toss. If that one is half, uh, heads, then you win four. And if the second one is also tails, uh, then you win zero. And then it ends then there. So this is our lottery. Okay. Now let's think of the final probability distribution induced by this lottery. So at the end of the day, this is the lottery I'm facing. At the end of the day, what are the possible outcomes? Two, four, or zero. Okay, what are the probabilities of these outcomes? This is probability half, four is probably one fourth, and zero is probably one fourth, right? Two consecutive uh, tails. Now, I can think of this as a lottery in itself. Okay, I could, I could create this same probability distribution through a somewhat different method. For example, you know, I have uh, an urn in which 25% uh, uh, of the balls are 
blue, 25% are green, and 50% are red. One is going to be drawn at random. If it comes up red, you win two rupees. If it comes up green, you win four rupees. If it comes up blue, you win nothing. Okay. That lottery, though a different physical process, creates the same probability distribution. Now, what is the last axiom telling us? The last axiom is telling us that these two lotteries will be equivalent from the, or, or the agent will be indifferent between them. Okay. In this lottery, uncertainty unfolds in stages. Over here, it unfolds in, in one shot. But the agent doesn't care because what the agent, what is important to the agent is the final probability distribution of these outcomes. And since those, those, that probability distribution is the same across these two lotteries, uh, the agent will just shrug and say, I don't care which one you give me. Now, uh, is that a reasonable assumption? Sir, yes. Sir, I have a question here. So, can you please show the uh, picture once more, the illustration you just made? So, in the second case where you're uh, bordered with the red one, so you're telling the I'm making an arm and I'm uh, filling it with uh, balls of different colors. So, the thing is, so uh, uh, just a few moments ago, Shotri had a similar conversation where you said, so uh, in this case, when I'm filling an arm with uh, different colored balls, I can assume this to be the population and I'm picking a sample of size one, right? In this case, because you're drawing one ball from a population which has a distribution yeah, but, like that. But, but the draw is only once. So the law of large numbers is irrelevant in both the lotteries. In the it, it'll be the stochastic process will be run only once. So so that is a red herring that uh, is uh, as far as this discussion is concerned. Okay, the both the lotteries that I have described, I'm describing it as a one-shot thing. Here the uh, we won't we won't repeatedly uh, do the same lottery and pay it out to you it, whether it's this coin toss based lottery or whether it's this earn based lottery this is going to be just one draw one trial okay. yes sir, yes so this makes it clear now thank you sir yeah. um so the reason for the agent's indifference is not based on the law of large numbers no Yes. Um, the reason for the agent's indifference is that the agent is, so to speak, consequentialist. What matters to the agent is, is uh, what's the probability distribution I can see at the end. Okay. Anyway, let's ruminate on it a little bit before moving on. Uh, anybody want to voice a reason why we may be skeptical of this. Yes, no. None? Okay, great. Let me not undermine the very assumptions on which we're doing the analysis. Uh, no, let me uh, suppose, you know, you can think of many examples which uh, would be problematic for this kind of framework and these kinds of assumptions. For example, you know, there's a, a cricket match, India is playing the uh, finals of the World Cup, wishful thinking given a performance right now. But uh, let's say we are in the finals, okay? And you have an important day long set of meetings, presentations, etc. you're occupied. You can't watch it live. So you have programmed your television to record it. And in the evening when you get home, you want to match, watch the match. And um, uh, <laughs> just as you are about to start, uh, your friend calls you and says, yay, we won. Right? Um, it ruins it for you, doesn't it? You want to watch the match, not knowing the result. Knowing the result will, will spoil you most of the fun. 
Um, so we often behave like that. Uh, so that's an example where you seek the uncertainty. You don't want it to be resolved early. You want it to be resolved late. Uh, and there are other examples where you may have exactly the opposite kind of preference. Uh, you, have, you have taken uh, an exam and uh, instead of your score and performance getting revealed right away, suppose the professor uh, acts in a sadistic manner and says, oh, today I'll tell you how much you got on question one, then end of the week I'll tell you question two and so on. I'll, I'll release the information in drips and drabs. Now, knowing it earlier uh, versus knowing it later or little by little uh, doesn't change the reality. You got what you got, right? But often we find it painful to, we want to know early rather than late. So, um, so sometimes, so a so couple of points, if you, if you think about the uh, examples which I just mentioned. One is that uh, um, the process through which uncertainty resolved itself is sometimes important to us. But also more pertinently, if you think about these examples, um, information sometimes has intrinsic value, okay? Uh, there are certain things we want to know as early as possible, some things that we want to postpone our knowledge, or we may even never want to know, and, and so on. Yes. Um, so those are all examples where information has intrinsic value. The kind of framework that we are building, in this kind of framework, information only has um, uh, instrumental value, meaning that it just helps us make better decisions, maybe. Uh, so, so in much of economics, in, in decision theory, choice under uncertainty, the, the uh, information is looked on as uh, something which is uh, only, only relevant instrumentally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's valuable only to the extent it, it helps us make better decisions. So from that perspective, this assumption would, would very much fit into that perspective that, that all that I care about is not how uh, the uncertainty results in Excel, but at the end of the day, what's the probability distribution? Okay, mm, Shohan. Sir, I was thinking about the examination results example, which you just mentioned, where the statistic teacher releases the marks in uh, several steps. So in that case, in suppose T1 time period, I have a certain utility from the first question's results. Then T2 period, I have a separate utility. And then suppose at the end of the week, the final answer comes out and I have another utility from that. So then here we are having utilities in different time periods as opposed to if all the results were announced at the same time at one moment, then uh, could I say that I have the utility equal to the summation of all of those utilities? And also in this case, in this form of von Neumann Morgan exams, which you're studying, do we account for such uh, different uh, uh, utilities in different time periods, or is it always one end final outcome? Implicit in your question and its formulation is a departure from uh, this sort of framework that I just said. When when you when you say that uh, uh, you know uh, the the uh, first uh, tranche of information is released on Monday and the next tranche will come on Friday and so on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know you have some utility. You are wondering, so that creates a state of mind and some utility. Uh, and and uh, should should I add it up? Calculate present discount value. If you think about it, implicit right there is an assumption that uh, facing this uncertainty intrinsically creates utility or disutility. Yes, yes, yeah. Right. So, so in that sense, this, this, in some sense, you know, this sort of much more instrumental approach would say there's no dis disutility. On Friday, you learn, you forget about it and go about your life. And don't care what, you know, just wait for all the information to come in. Um, yes. So, 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 so we are really ruling out this kind of nail-biting state of mind 
in the interim that's that's ruled out by this framework okay um all right so not too bad now let's go get to axiom five that's a key axiom it's called the substitution or the independence axiom there are multiple logically equivalent ways of stating it um um, this is a statement. Basically, what it's saying is the following. Uh, so I have some lottery. Could be a compound lottery. Uh, our possible outcomes are G1, G2, uh, G3, let's say. Probabilities are P1, P2, P3. And from this lottery, you do a little tweak and you construct a different lottery. Suppose take this outcome G2. This could be a lottery in itself. Okay, so G2, let's focus on that. G2, and suppose you have you know of another lottery H2, so that if the choice was just between G2 and H2, this agent would be different between them. Right? Um, okay, so now go back to this lottery and suppose we create a, a lottery where we take, we don't touch these two branches, these two arms, we, tuck, uh, we, we change the middle one. Okay, so G2 is, let's say, replaced by uh, H2. Okay, so if it were a pure choice between G2 and H2, the agent would have been indifferent. But if G2 is one part of a more complex lottery, and if we substitute G2 by H2 there in this, in this larger complex object, right, without touching the other outcomes without touching the probabilities. They continue to remain, to remain the same. So in the new lottery with probability P2, instead of getting G2, you're going to get H2. So the question is, does this substitution preserve the preference? Meaning that, you know, should the, uh, should the agent be indifferent between the original lottery and the new lottery obtained after substitution like this? And as in five, the independence or the substitution axiom is saying that the agent should continue to be indifferent. If she's indifferent between the pure lottery G2, H2, then uh, when G2 is just a component of a lottery and it's substituted by H2, that indifference should, should still apply. Okay. So is that a reasonable assumption? Anyone? Sir, if G2 and H2 are same for our consumer, our gambler, so um, are the probabilities associated with different events the same? I mean, the mean and the variance, they are equal for G2 and H2. No, 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 no. They are completely, they are same in preferences. They're not same in terms of probability distribution. They're very different probability distributions. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. If they were the same, then the question would be moot, right? If I, if G2 and H2 are different names for essentially the same lottery, then, then, then it would be a completely uh, trivial question. Why would I care if, if I just change the name, right? How do we define indifference then? What does it mean? Is there a mathematical interpretation to this indifference when we say oh, that G indifference is just a property of of, of uh, preferences? So, for example, I could you could you know your financial advisor could come to you with two options that you can put your money in fixed deposit and earn six percent interest, or you can put it in a mutual fund, which uh, probably half will give you ten percent returns, 
would probably half give you 0% returns. And he could say, I, 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 between these two options, I don't care. The options are totally different. The options are not identical. But you're permitted, you're allowed to be indifferent. In fact, I can always hook up some risk return uh, frontier, which will, which will keep you indifferent, right? So we look at the risk return frontier for this. Yeah, so it's, it's a subjective preference. Yes. Uh, in fact, <laughs> the average investor's indifference is what keeps uh, the financial markets going, right? If, if uh, stocks were much more attractive for, for most people than, uh, than, let's say, bonds or fixed deposits, then everyone in, will, will go and invest in the stock market and bonds won't sell and fixed deposits won't attract any investors. And so those people who are selling those things will try to make them attractive. So, so uh, the fact that there are various kinds of financial instruments floating around with very different risk return properties shows that the average investor in equilibrium has to be indifferent between them, right? So, in any case, uh, the meaning, in terms of the meaning, G2 and H2 are totally different. G2 is maybe a fixed deposit scheme. H2 is maybe a mutual funds. Uh, maybe G2 has lower return, but lower risk. H2 has higher return and higher risk. All things considered, suppose the agent is indifferent between them. Then the question is, if G2 and H2 are substituted like this in a more complex sort of lottery, will that preserve the indifference? Right? Okay, so um, just to give you a sense that this is, this is non-trivial, let me give you an example by analogy. It's not a risk-based choice, uh, but Let's think of food menus, okay? So let's say you have uh, uh, two food items, pizza and uh, dosa, okay? Mm. Um, Um, and uh, and you have cake and uh, gulab jamun. Yes, and suppose you're in different between pizza and dosa and between cake and gulab jamun. Now, I have, in the restaurant, you have a menu, which is a combo meal, uh, which consists of pizza and cake. Now, if the cake is substituted by gulab jamun, would you care? Well, you might, because you might think that, well, pizza and gulab, you know, I mean, I, either I want a more sort of Western kind of combo, or I want an Indian desi combo. Uh, this is a weird mix, right? Pizza and gulab jamun, and that doesn't go together, or dosa and cake. Just an example, yes. Uh, uh, right. Or take another example, suppose uh, you're indifferent between pizza and cake and uh, gulab jamun. Uh, Okay. Now, if the independence axiom were true, then that means that a combo meal of pizza and cake would be just as good as a combo meal of cake and gulab jam. Right. Or will that be true? Probably not. I mean, you you uh, perhaps want to call, you know, this, this combo, both are sweet items. So that's overkill. Uh, so if, if you could choose a, a single uh, item only, 
then you could have this indifference. But when it comes to combos of two, you may actually strictly prefer uh, the pizza and cake combination because it has you know something uh, salty with something sweet uh, as opposed to the cake and gulab jamun combo which is both sweets so so for diversity's sake you may actually strictly prefer this and that'll be a violation of the equivalent of the um, independence axis right um, so how things are combined sometimes matters uh, this is this is most easy to see when we are thinking of uh, combinations of various food items. Shonok. Sir, I have a question here. So in the first example, you uh, say in this example, say G1 equals to pizza and G2 equals to cake and H1 equals to dosa and H2 equals to gulab jamun. Say yeah, it's it's model like that. Here you're saying that uh, when, I, when, when I say if I replace G1 at G2 with H2, it's, it's just good enough because the person is indifferent between the two. But again, if I see, look at the menu as a whole, then the person is not indifferent. So uh, G1 and G, like, uh, will G1, G2 and G3 be a part of the utility function or just the outcome of the lottery? Because in the in the next axiom, axiom six, six, we saw that uh, the, the way in which the lottery is played doesn't matter, the final outcome matters, right, sir? Yeah. So why does... Uh, replacing like it should be indifferent right when you said uh, pizza and uh, like you said the uh, like uh, sweet overkill and all so that shouldn't matter right sir no no first of all of course the food menu example is not lottery it's i'm drawing an analogy there right uh, food menu is a food menu you're simultaneously uh, consuming multiple items in a lottery at the end of the day you get to consume only one of these, depending on which probability gets realized, right? So the two are not identical, they're, they're sort of analogous. Uh, so the reason I'm giving this example is to show that, you know, if I, uh, if I having studied von Neumann Morgenstern expected utility theory, studying these axioms, suppose I wanted to write a paper on people's preferences over food, right, individual items and combo menus. Uh, if I drew my inspiration from von Neumann Morgenstern theory, then I would uh, go on to make the assumption of extend this sort of independence axiom to my analysis of food choices, right? And there I would say, oh, as far as, you know, for these individual items, there's, there's indifference, then the consumer doesn't care in, you know, for combo meals, how, how these uh, things are combined. That wouldn't matter, right? I would make that assumption uh, being, being a follower of Von Neumann and Morgenstern. But there, empirically speaking, I'll probably be wrong because most of us would probably care in which case, in, in you know, how these things are uh, combined. So, so, um, so that's why I bring it up to say that, you know, there is, um, uh, if, if you look at this other domain like food preferences, there the independence axiom would almost, um, you know, almost obviously be false. So in those cases, can we say that the menu is all, also a part of the utility function? Like not only the individual items, but the menu as a whole is also a part. That's why someone will prefer a particular menu to another menu, like cake and gulab jamun. No one will prefer cake and gulab jamun, but they will prefer pizza and cake or pizza and gulab jamun or something like that. See, the thing is, maybe this is not entirely clear, but let me clarify this. Uh, people are free to have whatever kind of preferences they want, right? The question is we, when we are analyzing choices and preferences and demand functions and so on. Um, uh, we uh, Are we making realistic, uh, relevant assumptions or not, right? That's the question. Uh, if there's a clash between how most people out there are behaving and uh, what our assumptions say, then our assumptions are the loser, right? not the people out there. Uh, they are willing to have, you know, they are perfectly entitled to have whatever 
preferences they have. So, so when we create theories, um, the question, and when we are writing down axioms like this, uh, the, the, it's our axioms which are on the defensive, okay? So the point is having, having written down this axiom in the context of you know, choice under risk or uncertainty, uh, we are saying that, do we expect this axiom to be satisfied by most people most of the time? Uh, these, these preferences over food are pretty reasonable. I mean, most normal people would say, hey, the pizza and cake combination is better than the cake and you know, it, where, where it's all sweets, uh, everything is sweets. I mean, that's perfectly understandable and reasonable actually. Somebody who has the opposite, you know, uh, uh, somebody who satisfies the independence axiom would be weird actually from a, from a human uh, point of view. So can it be said that we have to also take into account the interaction between individual elements? That's why you are saying that cake and uh, gulab jamun will not be yeah, good enough. Course. Sometimes the interaction matters and sometimes it doesn't. The independence axiom says, says that the interaction doesn't matter and it may or may not be relevant in the field of you know, choices of you know, uh, investment and so on and so forth. Uh, when it comes to free food preferences, yes, the interaction clearly matters if we, if we introspect about it, right? When I'm offering a combo, what the mixture is, is, is obviously important to me. Yes, so the interaction element matters, but that's just another way of saying the same thing. I mean, saying that the independence axiom is violated when it comes to preferences of food combos, and to say that the interactive element matters is basically saying the same thing expressed in different ways. So the, okay. All right, so, okay, so I'll put a flag there, you know, this, so many, just, just before moving on, let me just say that, uh, you know, as we'll see that sometimes this sort of expected utility theory, you know, it works well up to a point, but there are anomalies, there are uh, experiments, observations, data, which show some departure from uh, behavior based on expected utility. Uh, so there have been attempts to build theories, alternative theories, which uh, depart from this, this kind of framework. And typically the action will be concentrated on axiom five. So people will go back to the drawing board. They'll change this axiom to something else, main primarily, and they'll build alternative theories of, of uh, choices of this kind, right? So, so this is the star of the show in that sense. This is the controversial one. Okay, now we, we, are, we are, right now we'll be one now monster and followers. So we'll accept this along with the other five. So here's the main result. This is uh, an extension of what you saw in the case of certainty. Uh, if these axioms are satisfied, then there exists a utility function going from the space of lotteries to the real line, which A represents preferences, okay? So I can assign a function, the function will, for every lottery, it will spit out a utility number, and that number will genuinely represent the ranking of the consumer. It'll, it'll give higher numbers to more preferred lotteries and vice versa. Um, that's the first thing. But the second thing, very important, is that uh, every lottery can then be evaluated by, or the utility of any lottery will be its expected utility. Okay. So you look at the final outcomes and the probability distribution, you put each final outcome into this utility function, you take the probability weighted average, that serves as the utility of the lottery, okay? In other words, 
this utility function that we're talking about is linear in probabilities. That's the important property that under these axioms, uh, we can not only find a utility function to represent preferences over lotteries, but that utility function will be linear in probabilities. Yeah. Uh, now, in this framework, we take as given, these probabilities are called, they are sort of given, right? The, uh, these are called objective probabilities, right? In some problems, the probabilities are well-defined. So for example, if I offer you a, like the St. Petersburg lottery, right? An unbiased coin will be tossed, first time heads two rupees, second time heads four rupees, et cetera, et cetera. There we know the probabilities of the various outcomes, right? There's, there's no debate or controversy or guesswork over, over that. Now, if it comes to uh, various mutual funds, let's say, uh, what are the probabilities of various rates of return? That's not written in stone. We are going to take a guess on that. So, for some applications, we have subjective rather than objective probabilities. Uh, so Leonard Savage extended the theory to, to such frameworks, okay? Uh, where uh, the representation theorem basically, simply speaking, says that there exists a utility function and there exists a belief vector, a, you know, a probability uh, that the agent thinks uh, arises from a particular lottery uh, so that the utility function and that uh, subjective probability uh, together uh, uh, rationalizes all the choices of the agent. Anyway, I'm, I'm just mentioning it. Let's come back to the case of objective given probabilities and we'll, we'll stick to that. Um, so we have a very nice theorem. Okay. Um, And that theorem will prove to be extremely useful. Um, let me skip over the proof. I'll come back to that. Uh, let me talk about the second theorem and I'll end after that for today. Um, if you think back to choice under certainty, remember there are two main results. One is the existence of a utility function. Second was that the utility function is not unique. Uh, you can take any positive monotone transformation and the new function will also be a valid utility function. So the question here is, is that still true when we are talking of this sort of uncertain prospects? And the short answer is uh, the utility function is still not unique. More than one utility function can represent the same preferences over lotteries, but it's a smaller class than, than before. In particular, uh, there has to be all the utility functions that capture preferences must be uh, linearly related to each other. Okay. Uh, so, more specifically, suppose we know that U is a valid utility function for a particular agent over a set of lotteries. Uh, and suppose we construct a new function, which is a linear transformation, right? We multiply by a positive constant and add any constant to create a new function. That new function will also represent the same preferences. But that connection goes two ways, okay? Um, meaning that if u is a valid utility function and so is v then there has to be a linear relationship of this kind between the two functions one has to be a linear transformation of the other uh, otherwise they cannot capture the same preferences so so it's if and only if okay so in in standard sort of choice theory you have much more leeway much more flexibility in your choice of utility function for example you could take a log transformation and the new function remains a utility function here you're not allowed to do that but you can take any linear transformation that is fine so these are the two sort of pivotal results that uh, utility functions exist and only linear transformations are allowed on these utility functions uh, 
So I'll prove these two results and then look at some applications. Okay. Um, any questions? Excuse me, sir. Yes. So just one doubt related to the continuity axiom. So when we